Hey guys, welcome back to the National High School Football com or nationalhsfb.com either way we'll, we'll take it uh we uh we're wrapping up our summertime national uh prominent head coaching uh not search but tour really joe we're doing a virtual tour all over the country and we've had a good time this this summer joe interviewing the most prominent best uh brightest football minds at the prep level all across the country and tonight is no different. I mean, we, we, we may have, you know, this might be, I, I don't know. I don't want to catch anybody off guard, but we may have saved the best for last. We don't know yet, right? <laughs> so, anyway, with that said, we want to welcome to the program Coach Masai Haller, Hallamarium. I almost, I almost messed it up, Coach. Coach Masai Hallamarium with St. Francis Academy out of Baltimore, Maryland. So, Coach, welcome to the program, and we're thrilled to have you. Thank you for having me. I look forward to it. Being able to say, I think you did pretty good with my name, you know, considering other people that have done it for the first time. But thank you for having me, for having us. Absolutely. Joe, why don't you ask the coach our first question? Hey, coach, and there was a method behind our madness. There's a reason you're the last interview before we go on to the regular season, start of, uh, you know, the August 19th weekend. Um, congratulations on being named preseason number one in our inaugural National High School Football.com poll. We're Thank happy, you. We're, we're happy to have you there. It's our inaugural poll. We've been getting great feedback from the fans around the country about our poll and its originality and, and how accurate they think it is. So you're a big, big part of that. And, and um, uh, you know, we saved you for this last interview because you're the number one team in America. So, so that being said, um, I want to talk about your 2022 team. A lot of great ballers on it. Uh, last I counted, and I might even be wrong, the number might be higher, but only, literally in your junior and senior classes, only those two classes, you have a, about a minimum of 27 D1 recruits or prospects. So question, when we're watching you, and again, you're, we're, you know, you're a major co a corporate partner of PGL, and also a lot of your games are going to be on the Flow Football channel. Uh, when we're watching our, our computer and the, the game – against East St. Louis uh, on Saturday, the 27th of August. Tell us on each side of the ball, the players that, that are going to jump out off the screen at us, the players we need to know ahead of time be looking at on each side of the ball. Absolutely. I mean, you start with your signal caller on the offensive side, and uh, I have one of the most you know brightest up-and-coming young uh, quarterbacks at the high school level. He's been with us for two years now, his freshman year is, uh, you know, COVID shortened. He played two games and he participated. We had a four-year starter, John Griffith. Um, but Mike Van Buren, I think this year is going to be, you know, it's not a surprise to anyone. He did very well in, in spot duty last year. His first start ever on ESPN against De La Salle on national TV with a storied program. He came out blazing and he was 16 for 19, 247, four touchdowns in the first half. And he, he tied Mark, Matt Leinard's record and DJ, I don't know his last name, <laughs> me, Daniel Bosco. And yeah. had I known or somebody had told me those stats, I would have probably let him break that record. But to say the least, he's a really prominent person. He's he's, catal he's catapulted himself into the face in terms of our offense. Right behind him is Darrell Robinson, our returning running back who you know has well over 20 offers. He's a dynamic player who, who showed spurts of greatness last year. And when he came in IMG, he started. He, second or third play of the game, he ran off that 60, 70 yard touchdown, and he was that guy. You know, he didn't get that many touches because we had another guy that was going to NIU. And then on the receiver position, we have Ryan Manning, who's committed to University of Maryland, and he's he's another one that's you know coming on board. Unfortunately, we we would have been speaking about Lamar Patterson, mm -hmm. uh, that beautiful young man that soul that we all know and got to love and, and cherish. He would have been a big part of what we do this year in offense and when we when we lost Lamar to that horrific accident um, you never could or even imagine that we would get anything remotely close to replacing him and we have a couple of guys that I think will take on the load and Ryan being the leader of that group um, and then the offensive line you know we've got some surprises in in the fold uh, we have PJ Wilkins uh, Dominique Wilkins nephew from Georgia he's a great young man 6'7 350 I think he's going to do some dynamic things on the offensive side. Then moving over to defense, everyone knows, and 
loves Deshaun Womack, four-year guy with us. Uh, I mean, a dynamic, extremely freakish edge guy who has watched a group, a slew of players from St. Francis, starting with Iabi and Noma all the way to Chris Braswell, come out of this this program and really show who they are and what they're capable of doing at the collegiate level. But I, I believe Womack physically has the most upside that I've seen in a long time in anybody that came out of that group. So it was a lot on the shoulder. But this and Derek Moore, of course. Remember Derek Moore, um, Gatorade player of the year, yep. MVP in the Under Armour game, and now he's upcoming. He's a freshman at Michigan. I mean, we could just list on and on, but there's a lot of pressure on him because last year Derek was taking the double teams. Deshaun kind of got introduced to the national scene, and this time it's on his shoulders on, on defense. And then we have some great linebackers, uh, other edge guys also, uh, Brian Sims. We got some – our defense, honestly, conceivably – I can't sit here and I can look at every single player on the back half in the front seven and say this is probably the best defense St. Francis football has ever been put together mm-hmm. before, and that's saying a lot. And that's saying a um, lot, man. Hey, Larry, I, I've seen New, for St. Francis up here a few times. Um, they played St. Joe's of, of Montvale, New Jersey, and Don Bosco, both both really good teams, nationally ranked top top two, three in New Jersey every year. His record, his the combined scores of those two games was 55 to nothing. <laughs> Listen, I remember St. Francis when they came down to my. This is my first exposure to St. Francis when they came down. Coach, y'all came down. I can't remember how many years ago, Joe. Was it four or five years ago when Lee County had just won a state championship from out of Leesburg, Georgia? And uh, yeah. Coach, uh, you guys came down uh, to little old Leesburg, Georgia. Uh, for a postseason type of exhibition game. And, man, was that an impressive team. As soon as they stepped off on that field, <laughs> you could tell this was a team. Yeah, I mean, that's that's exactly right. It was a couple of years ago. Lee County, I think, was like on an, over a 20-game winning streak. There, It was a great atmosphere for us. I mean, we're yeah. from Baltimore City, and, and we're not used to that southern football where they're, it's a packed house, baby, and, Every everybody in that stands looking for a great game, and, and Lee County did an amazing job of hosting us. Uh, it was the Geico Bowl and and, and that series. And That's to right. be honest, it was it was a great introduction to what I thought our guys were capable of doing. Were you talking about you know Georgia football, Ohio, Texas, Florida, California? That's some good old football. So to put Maryland, the state of Maryland, and Baltimore and in, in the city in in that same breath is a, really an amazing opportunity for us to give our young men that same platform that all these other states have on a regular basis. Yeah. A while ago, you said uh, something to the effect of it's going to be interesting to see how uh, uh, one of your players handles the pressure uh, of the upcoming season. Now, let me ask you a a kind of a related question. You guys are entering this season as a, I guess, um, a consensus number one across the country. Now, with that comes pressure in itself. Do you feel that feel that pressure? Does that does the team feel it? How do you guys handle it? Or have you been up there in the rankings long enough? Is it just another day at the office? Well, it never it never is easy. I mean, let's put it that way. You always prepare, you know, to always have a chip on your shoulder. And yeah. the term I always use is regardless how full your belly feels, you always have to feel like it's touching your back. So you have to create okay. that hunger. So we allow ourselves the opportunity to be excited that we are capable of playing against anybody and willing to do it. But from a humble perspective, football is football. And, and at the end of the day, 11 players line up at any moment, given moment. So that 11 have to execute. It only takes one or two to, to, to mess up a particular play. So I always keep it as simple as possible. You know, this is what you've been doing your whole life. We, we have a, a level of standard expectation, but I always feel like we're the underdogs. I, I never, I never get up in the morning and feel like, St. Francis is anybody's top dog. I feel like we, we, we got to come out blazing and we always got to be competitive and we got to play three times, four times harder than anybody else on any given day because we're capable of getting beat. That's just the way I say it to him from when we first started to now. Yeah, Coach. And, and Larry, this team, he's got a special group. Uh, as, as I tell coaches when they, they get to the top, um, Whenever you, you, you know you've made it to the top, yeah. when all of a sudden these rumors start coming out that you recruit, your boys are 19, 20 years old, and um, uh, just, it's just bad stuff. I mean, they're at that point now where the haters 
or you know are going nuts online. Um, and every time, I, I, what I love about the team is they 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 just shut everybody up by winning dominantly, winning professionally, winning respectfully, taking it, taking care of it on the field. Not not, and it's hard to do, man, with social media when people are against you and they're tagging you, and and it's hard to ignore that stuff. But you know he he's taught the boys to do such. And they're all business, man. When I when 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 you go to a, a a game live, and they walk out on the field, and you look, I, I I've seen it so many times. The 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 other, the stands of the opposing team, they basically they they shut up and they look petrified. Um, so, it's a it's a talented team. It's sure. one of the biggest high school football teams I've ever seen, live on a field. Uh, and but they got their heads on their shoulders right. I met the boys. I did a trip to Baltimore a few months ago. Coach gave me a tour of the school, um, or I got to meet some of the players. It, the, the nicest bunch you'd ever you'd ever want to want to meet, and you'd ever want to coach. I mean, uh, so so you know, it, it it pains me when these haters are, are start rumors about them mm. from, from you know from all over the country. But you know what? In the end, it means you've made a coach. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I I always tell him and the boys. Uh, any team, you know, this is the same with Matter Day, St. John Bosco, IMG, St. Francis. As they rise to greatness, um, the haters come out in full force. Uh, but I always say, you know what? Use that to fuel, fuel your energy, fuel your passion, and that's what he does e- each and every year. You know, he he's in a league; his own league doesn't want to play him, Larry. Right. I mean, that's how bad it is. I mean, he's he's basically the de facto number one team in his conference and in the state every year. So, um, it, 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 they've gotten through that, and and again, I truly believe the best is yet to come. Absolutely, I appreciate it, Joe. And like he said, I mean, the only thing that we're guilty of is winning. To be honest with you, everything else we've done according to what's required, whether we participate in MIAA or state requirements. You know, we we MPSSA sanctioned National High School Federation and MIAA when we played in it. There's not a rule we broke. Uh, we weren't fined. We weren't doing anything. We didn't break any bylaws. These are all high school students that have played their eligibility as is afforded to them like every other high school player. Um, our players are the same kids that are being recruited by all the private school conference players in our own state and surrounding DMV. So, you know, like he's, like Joe said, the biggest frustration on on majority of people is the fact that, you know, I use it. I, I, I use the term, you know, it's no fun when the rabbit got the gun. We used to get beat by each and every one of these schools when I first was the head coach building the program handily. Let's be honest. I mean, I won in the lowest conference, built the team to get to the highest conference in MIAA. I took my lumps. You know, we did as a group, as an organization. But I got up every day and told them that the sun rises again. And in order to be the best, you have to beat the best. And that's what sports creates. It's an environment where somebody is favored and the other one is an underdog. That's the reality. And sometimes the favorites are not really true favorites. But the point I'm making is that's that's life. And we try to incorporate the same concept that you're going to face when it comes to the real world. When you get out of this high school environment or even the sports environment, let's let's say the sports environment, the real world, the lights have to get paid for. The bills have to be paid. Uh, Nobody's worried about whether or not you didn't come up with the mortgage or the rent. you got to come up with it. So the reality is you got to 10 toes down, get up. Fight for what you want, and if it doesn't work out that day, do it again in the morning, all over again. And that's what we try to incorporate, and that's what we always are about. And regardless who it is, we're not afraid to play, only because guess what happens? You either win or you lose the game. But you end up winning in life when you teach them how to overcome those moments. The Aquinas lost to Roger. Most people, I mean, it was frustrating. It was hurtful. We were close. We turned the ball over. But that was great medicine for our kids. We had 126 in a row, some number like that. And at some point in life, you got to get punched, get knocked down, and get back up again and do it again. That's what we look forward to. At least that's a good coach. Yeah, Larry, coach is right. They'll they'll play anybody anywhere. You know, they only have two losses in the last five years. Mm. And to two teams that were on our broadcast. Yeah. uh, (laughs) Matter Day and and, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. So, so they're they're right up there. They're like I said, there are four teams that are feared in the world world of high school football. For me, as a as a promoter, the four hardest teams to find games for are St. Francis, Matter Day, St. John Bosco, and IMG. 
those four. And those four need each other, too. Yeah. I feel in my heart of hearts, they need each other. They should be playing each other annually, and hopefully we'll get to that point. Coach, listen, like Joe was talking about, you know, when you, when you rise to the top and you stay there for a sustained period of time, you, you're going to have your doubters. You're going to have haters. They're going to throw some fiery darts at you. But from every coach that we've interviewed this summer, I mean, we've interviewed some really, really premier coaches, modern day, Miami Central, uh, you know, um, Trent Dilfer uh, up in Tennessee and, and many, many others. And Joe, th what I've noticed is uh, all those schools, because they are peren perennial powerhouses, they be coach, they become destinations for players and their families right so uh, so a lot these schools are basically so good and they've been so good for so long that you guys don't have to recruit a lot of your players come to you right uh, absolutely i mean that's what happens when you build a brand or, absolutely you know, so the brand becomes the the purpose and the, and the platform and we've done our job and look prior to uh, you know kind of getting a bursting on the national scene in 2016 St. Francis struggled in enrollment. It struggled in, in, in everything that you would want a school to flourish in. But because of what God has allowed to happen, and yeah. that's what it is, well, because of God, what he's allowed to happen, we are thriving in so many more facets than just football. What people fail to realize, we sent 100, over 126 young men in the last five years on full scholarships to college. Of wow. that, 40 of them, listen to this, 40 of them have gotten their first degree and they have either one or two years at least eligibility left, and they're getting masters with it. Forty, six did it this past mm -hmm. semester. So for me, when we look at this platform, when we talk about having kids come to a place that that you just hope we can bridge the gap and let them yeah. go get a free education at the college level. So even as a program, let's be honest. I mean, he said the twenty-seven. We have over five hundred and fifty offers out there, just on our program alone to Division One schools. Now. It, that speaks for itself. I don't know yeah. what else to say but that. And then people want to spin it and make it about everything else as opposed to exactly what it is. The yeah. proof is in the pudding. The pudding is the young men that are out there doing exactly what they're supposed to do. Schools like Alabama, Michigan, Georgia, powerhouses. But then there's West Point. We just had a kid graduate from Army. We had a kid graduate from Duke. We have a player at Vanderbilt. Um, we have FCS. We have Jackson State, Alabama, A&M. Alabama State, Morgan State. We have a kid at Howard. I mean, uh, so for me, Merrimack, we have seven of them at Merrimack. We have them at Maryland. Uh, we have a kid at Minnesota. So I, I, last I checked, in order for them to all qualify and be in that position, some things have to happen. That's called the NCAA. But more importantly, um, I think their families have to allow these young men to be a part of who we are. And so as long as the families are okay, and God tells me every night that I can sleep easy at night, then I'm okay with the rhetoric, the criticism, the ridicule, because until you've been in our building and you've yeah. shaken our hands mm -hmm. and you've seen what we do daily, you have absolutely zero stance. You just can't speak mm -hmm. about something you have no clue about. And I look forward to showing people that just because we don't have the acres and acres of land, which most schools do, but I don't cry about it. We have to transport our players 30 minutes to practice every day with a 15, two 15 passenger vans. And, and maybe we don't even know what field we're practicing weekly. So we, 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 we do three to four fields, but we don't cry. We don't. All we do is we do exactly what we do every day. We allow that to be the motivation for us to compete and travel and try to beat anybody we can. And guess what? The money's not on a platter for us. We have to raise it. The school can't incur that kind of cost. So I go out there and there's some good people out here in this world still that see this mission and vision make sense. And they try to support us the best we can. Hey coach, That's awesome. um, I, hope, I, I always like to say, although a lot of your, your conference affiliates are against you and don't want to play you, I still call you Baltimore's team. Amen. I mean, I, you know, I just this past weekend, I, I know a bunch of people from who live all around Baltimore came and, and they did the landscaping around the school. Can you tell us about how the, the city of Baltimore has embraced you? or has embraced the school. Now, Larry, you got to remember, this is not, a lot of the haters think this is like a pop-up school that just sh showed up after five years. This high school is 194 years old. Yeah. <laughs> it's been there before, and it will, it's, it's going to continue to be. A woman was a renegade nun who was brought here against her will to be a slave. And before, 
emancipation happened, she founded this beautiful called St. Francis Academy, who educated children of color how to read the Bible. And that platform has since manifested, it used to be an all-girls school, to an unbelievable co-ed school who utilizes sports, but that's utilizes as a catalyst to bridge the gap. And then the community has seen tremendous growth. And the initiative around East Baltimore, where there's food desert, they wasn't landlocked land. Everything that's probably tough has been in Baltimore over these last years. This is a beacon. This is a light. This is a an amazing uh, platform. And, and the community, businesses, you know, we had volunteers, but we also had expert volunteers, businesses, landscape companies, uh, uh, power washing. Just they embraced us. They came in and really gave the school a facelift like a week ago, two weeks ago. So we're so grateful. Um, we're about to build a stadium. Um, uh, across the street, which is amazing. It's been a 10 year in progress and I started it. I, I went to city hall for at least like 30 to 37 days straight trying to get a public private partnership. And now it's manifest into something. So we don't have to run around everywhere for us to practice. And then not just St. Francis football, but we're also added soccer. You know, we're doing wrestling. We have basketball. Um, and then we have a STEM lab. I mean, there's so many things we can see here talk yeah. about that has made an impact on our community Joe said it best. It's Baltimore's team, but let, let me let me elaborate a little bit. It's also Maryland's team. I don't care what anybody tells me. We represent Maryland like it's supposed to be represented. We go around this country and show them that the state of Maryland can compete against anybody at any day, any time. And we're not afraid to compete against whoever decides to play against us. So guess what that shows? That shows moxie. It's not it's not arrogance. It's confidence. That's right. But the the, the reality of it is, in order to, to really survive in this world, you have to be confident. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be arrogant, but you got to be confident. And you got to know that you got to be able to fight against anything that comes at you. And that's what football creates. Right. Hey, Coach, you, you mentioned uh, the, you know, being the pride of Baltimore. And I, I, I've seen it for myself. Uh, as you know, I also have a family member who lives in Baltimore now full time. So I see it when I'm down there, too. Um, you think there'll ever be a day when you're playing the other top Baltimore teams like DeMatha and Good Counsel annually? That's that's the goal. So, you know, for at the beginning, when they did that, they, ex, they ostracized us. I'm talking about in my own conference and then yeah. around the surrounding of the WCAC. I used to fight it. I'm be honest with you, Joe. And I used to say, you know, it's not fair. It is not. But what I learned again was sometimes if you're not wanted, why try to fight a place that doesn't want you, right? So you do it best and you do it better. And I said to myself, we teach our kids, go where you wanted, not tolerated. Right. Go where you're coveted, not tolerated. So what I've done is we try to establish as a school and support from our head of school, Dr. Uh, you know, Dr. Turner, Melissa, our associate head of school, mm -hmm. Nick Miles, my athletic director. And then before I came back as the head coach, uh, Biff Pogey and Amy Pogey, who did a tremendous job of injecting resources and finances to a program that was on the brink, on the cusp of not doing as well as it should because football is expensive. But to, to make mention of us playing them, I would love to, but we're not going to sit here and hold our breath. Yeah. So my job is to play offense and not defense. So yeah. I'm trying to defend ourselves. I'm going to go play offense. I'm going to go play against anybody, mm -hmm. anytime. And then what it's done is it's elevated the school. Yeah, so it right. elevated the state. At some point, if you say you don't want us to have all these players, kids come to a place where they are being coached to play against the best and they want to be developed against the best. They don't want to go in an environment where they're playing the same old cushion bubble, which we used to play in too, and think you're being challenged. We first played IMG in 2016 and the last game of the season, our first national scene, we played Paramus and we played IMG, to be honest with you. And, and I, and I played Paramus before I, Biff came and I played ECA yep. and all the, you played you, you played Iona Prep, right? Matt, back in the day, Iona Prep, Paramus Catholic, my alma mater. We, you were you were doing it a little bit before Biff got involved. Absolutely, yeah. a lot more than people think. Mm -hmm. We played against Rashawn Gary, uh, Peppers, and then uh, e, uh, um, what's it called Friendship Collegian had Tabor. They had uh, Eddie Goldman, all those guys when they yeah. were NFL yeah. guys. But we played against them. But the point I'm making is, kids want that. Mm -hmm. Strong athletes want that. So if they really want to say that they want to bring and have the best on their programs if they want to keep them from coming to us play us mm -hmm. then you can say you're, you're competing against the top five team in the country you don't have to go anywhere to get that competition you can stay right here but as long as they 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 don't play us i promise you this 
if they're any worthy, really competitive, strong football players, they're going to want to come to a place where they're, they're lined up against somebody great every week. That's what and you listen, know. and coach, being ranked in the top three to five every year, you know, those rankings, you know, they help, they help you get noticed and, and they help kids want to, you know, want to come and be a part of that versus being ranked in the 2000s, you know? Yeah. Absolutely. Coach, a while ago when uh, when Joe asked you about being Baltimore's team, you kind of expanded on that answer, and you started to say – you went on to say Maryland's team. Right before you said Maryland's team, I thought you were going to make the claim of being America's team. And I'm thinking, <laughs> wait a minute, the Dallas Cowboys have got that title. All right, so hey, – that, That's my favorite team too. <laughs> <laughs> People might not like to hear that. Baltimore Ravens, I'm sorry. No, since mm -hmm. I was a kid. But, yeah, no, I wouldn't dare say that because there's so much out here in America. But I represent – we represent Baltimore with all the pride in the world. We're really excited to say that. And then we also go a little further, DMF, D.C., Maryland, Virginia, but definitely the Maryland, the state of Maryland, we mm -hmm. represent. And I feel and, like – And, Larry, he, he, they, they, they may be Baltimore's team, but, but I'm really um, – upset you know their own town paper the baltimore sun doesn't give them the time of day yes won't write about them being preseason number one i mean it's 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 really bad it's bad well the reason i asked you that that question uh kind of in, in jest like that was you know uh you went on to talk i, I think you used this word the best like seven times i have to go back and look at the tape and you kept emphasize. Is that something that you really instill in your your kids? Is that a personal goal of yours to be recognized as the best? Absolutely. So let me tell you, in life in general, I've been blessed enough to be in an environment where I came from a third world country and my parents were brave enough to leave a comfortable situation for them to give their children a better education, a better platform. And hence, they brought us to the United States. Then I became naturalized. And then my dad tried to introduce me to football, his version of it. It was soccer, but it was actually American football. I got given a helmet, shoulder pads, and football, and I learned in fourth grade. But what football did for me personally, I was a walk-on at University of Maryland, but it bridged the gap and met some tremendous people, so I became a successful entrepreneur after college. It, it, it allowed me a network that I otherwise wouldn't have tapped into. I was a successful businessman. And then years later, I, you know, I become a father. When my daughter was three years old, my wife and I at the time got the most devastating news. She was diagnosed with skin cancer. Mm. People don't know my it. Why I got to full time high school football coaching was three months after God has spared her. She was in her remission that I was offered the job and I turned it out three times. Was the worst job conceivably in American football. We were ranked 16,700 when I took over. We we're one in 39, lost 33 in a row in four years. All the coaches have quit on kids midway through the year. But more importantly, in four years, not one kid went to college. So lost first two games by 80. So mm -hmm. I have I've been on record the second day I took that job. It's on record. It's a QA. I can send it to anybody. I said this program that day. And I looked outside. I was outside and it was abandoned houses. Well, it has the potential to be the number one team, at least top five team in the United States. And I didn't do it when it was obvious. I did it when we only scored seven points in four years, but I saw a group of young men that were extremely athletic, freakish, that were playing, some of them without cleats, outdated shoulder pads, no field, grass fields that had holes in it in Patterson Park. And then people were taking advantage. We were everybody's homecoming. It was okay to beat up on St. Francis then. And it was okay to pat us in the back, but kids weren't going to college. Hence, we built it. We won in the two years in the conference, won 30 games in a row, moved to the A conference, competed really well, one game away from winning the title in the A. And then, of course, the resources started tapping out. And I courted Biff. I said, hey, I heard you leaving. Instead of going somewhere, I'll, come, I'll step aside as the head coach. You become the head coach. So the resources that you can offer, I was taught this when I was young, relinquish power to gain influence, Masai. A good, good businessman told me that. A good man, when I was 16 years old, Relinquish power to gain influence. And Biff became that influence for us from a resource standpoint. But I was right beside him. I helped make the decisions. I did the schedule. I did everything a head coach did. I just wasn't by name. But he was the person, the catalyst. He taught me a lot. I learned a lot from him. He was at Michigan for a year, did really well. And now he's back at Michigan now. And the only difference is he's 
moved on, but I still do the same thing. But the best is what we strive to be. Every college head coach wants to be the national champion. Every high school football coach should want to be the best in the country. I don't want to be the best in my cocoon and win by 50 against everybody and not have a challenge because what are you really teaching? I have college, I mean, I have high school coaches worried about whether or not they're going to win instead of they're going to develop. I'm being honest. That's just, let's call it a, a spade a spade. You yeah. know, they, they want to win instead of develop. Challenging yourself to play against better people is why you're going to end up developing your players. They're going to learn. Coach, are you still there? I'm here. Okay, okay. Well, we, we lost, lost your sound there seconds. momentarily. Give us the last so five I, seconds. Yes, I just, you know, that is a big deal for me. And, and development, development is, is what it looks like is going up against the best, getting challenged. I told you IMG in 2016 gave us the business the first four minutes of the game. We were down 21 or 28 nothing. And that was, a, that was a taste in my mouth that I would never want to take again. We just didn't give them a chance to be exposed to that kind of platform before. And that's when it, it, it woke me up as a head coach. And, and Larry, uh, the, last, the last two years, last two times they played IMG, they beaten them. Not many teams in America could say that. Wow. Joe, Actually, uh, nobody IMG more than one. Joe, well, I don't exactly. know what and, it is and, about and, this program, Joe. Yeah. Yeah. that uh, we've had some great coaches that have come up with some great quotes. <laughs> I, I don't know who has the better quotes, Trent Dilfer, Roger Harrington, or Messiah Hallamariam. <laughs> yep, yep. No, they're all, they're I'm, all I'm great. I'm just st steadily taking notes of what you guys are saying. They're great quotes. Hey, hey, like, uh, I, I love it when you I, said uh, relinquish power to gain influence. Sometimes they want to win instead of developing. That's good stuff, man. That's great stuff. That's life stuff. Think about it. That's life stuff. As a man, you know, my tagline with us now, I don't know if you know, but after every offer, every situation, mm -hmm. we at St. Francis SFA football build protectors and providers, not pretenders and takers. Old school football, old school man. What a family develops is a protector and a provider first, not a pretender and taker. Now society creates this facade of social media that you're better than you really are in life. You have to create this false uh, sense of security, false sense of accomplishment. Well, the old school principles used to be a man is built to protect and provide for his family. Hey, Larry, and, where and we the, who, where'd we just hear that from? Last week, Coach Harriet yeah. said the same thing, Coach. Yep. Same thing. Yeah. Me, Roger and I are on the same page. Now, I, I tried to play Roger again. I know he got me the first week. I can say it publicly. Hey, Roger, I've been wanting to get another one. I know Florida. <laughs> I asked <laughs> Bruce at Mata Day. I can say it loudly in front of everybody. Bruce, Roger, uh, our neck, was it St. Joe Bosco? I always forget his name. I apologize. Jason, Jason, uh, Coach Jason. Jason. Jason's a good man. Look, I just want to play you guys, man. We're going to, I'm probably, you know, I'm okay with getting my teeth kicked in if that's what you guys do to us. That's yeah. life. But we're playing Kahuku, so we're excited. We're playing DeSoto this year. We're playing some great yeah. programs. And we're excited to have the opportunity to travel. Now, unfortunately, I've never seen a high school team travel as much as I'm about to do. Yeah, we're, so we're going we're gonna, gonna to get into that now. That's the ne next topic is uh, your schedule, okay? Well, i uh, got a 10-game ten, ten schedule published right now. We're still getting trying to get you another one or two games in October. We're, we're working yes, hard every day to do that. But, Larry, first five games on the road, okay? So let let me tell you who they're playing and, and the ranking of the team last year at the uh, year-end ranking. East St. Louis, Illinois, 124. DeSoto, Texas, 63. Venice, Florida, 11. Dutch Fork, South Carolina, 169. Kahuku, 8. And then last game of the season, season it's strategically placed at the end of November because if these two teams are both undefeated, undefeated it's going to be the, the de facto mythical national championship game. They're hosting IMG at the University of Maryland. Wow. So, so – yeah, that I mean, you got those six. You got six games of teams ranked last year between number eight and one sixty nine. This has never been done in the history of high, of high school football. Never, wow. ever, not even close. And I'm damn proud of it because I helped put it together. And four of those six games are going to be on Flow Football Channel. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, I, I love it. I mean, 
I, I guess that's what you want, right? That's what the, the people want to see. That's they what the people getting, want to see. Yeah, I mean, that's you look forward to that, man. Everybody looks forward to the matchup that makes sense, right? We don't want lopsided. We want a competitive environment that gives anybody a chance to, to, to take an L that particular day. What are you going to do to prevent yourself from losing? That's it. Coach, you know, when you look at a schedule like this year after year after year, I guess I'm going to answer my own question here. Um, obviously, you've got to have the studs to play a schedule like this. But it's it's one thing of being a super talented high school kid uh, and then being a, a, a really super talented college kid. Do you think schedules like this from top to bottom – when, when, when your kids get to the college level, they're ready to go. And that's why, that's why they're succeeding so quickly. Absolutely. I've heard quotes from publicly. I mean, there's been some few national power head coaches at the collegiate level that have said one of the best things that they've seen from our guys is uh, they're a little bit, they just a tad bit more prepped for this process. And uh, you're not talking about skill set talent. You know, most kids have the physical tools yeah. and attributes in their kitty the spiritual groundedness and the mental toughness is, is the biggest biggest thing that you have to develop in young people let's be honest so knowing how to get up at five in the morning on their own being ready to do uh, you know workouts winter workouts showering changing getting ready for class going through school having that time frame of study hall right after uh incorporating then going to practice then having dinner and study hall because we board 40. That basically is a schedule that we try to adhere to and keep. And what does that do? It preps them for the commitment level it takes to be at the collegiate level. Most kids have a hard time transitioning, not just being away from home, but also not being able to get everything handed into your lap and knowing that you have to be committed to a process, not committed to a football game. Because yeah. think about it. We play 10 games in a year. That's 10 days. There's 355 other days there. Then I'm just giving an average, but two hours per day per game. So that's 20 hours. Look at the amount of hours it takes to prepare for those exciting moments. Right. That's where it lost in the shuffle. But to answer your question, coach, I mean, I mean, who that's what they look for. I've heard colleges say they'll take my second or third the end. Then they would somebody else's number one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, hey, um, uh, Coach, you, you taught – and, Larry, what, what I want to mention, you got to remember, on a good year, these guys will have 10 or 11 games. Other states that are competing for the championships, national championship, they have 15, 14, 16. So they need a, a really high strength of schedule yeah. so they can compete with somebody who had a 15 or 16-game schedule. And, and, and if they're – I'm telling you right now, if they're undefeated with this schedule, they're going to finish number one and at least one poll in America, that's for sure. Amen. Listen, Joe, it wouldn't be a national HSFB.com interview without ask me asking you and the coach, like, Coach, the last time you guys came down to South Georgia, whooped up on a Lee County team, I'm throwing down a challenge for St. Francis to come to Valdosta, Georgia, and take on my mighty Lounge Vikings. I think we'll put a whooping on you guys. Hey, I've been caught. As a matter of fact, <laughs> I would look forward to it. I would come in with bells on. <laughs> I would like hey, Larry. Hey, Larry, do, do us all a favor. Call the AD and let me know when he calls you back about that game. Yeah, I was about to say, he might not call you back, brother. <laughs> you might be excited. The yeah. kids, let me tell you about kids, though, young men that do play the sport. There's yeah. not one of them I feel would not want to play us. I mean, I'm being very honest. I've seen it. I've met them. The kids are extremely competitive. You know who ruins this? It's us adults. Yeah. We make it political. We make it all the BS that doesn't need to be. And, and I include myself in that because sometimes I have to group myself. I'm an adult. So if, if we allow the kids' pureness to be the reason why we do it, to be, compete, we would have a pretty decent, very competitive, and unbelievable seasons year in and year out. And once that happens, that's going to be beautiful to watch. Yeah. And – and, and, and it will be something I think it can be worked out. I think it could be created. Um, we're not just renegade team. We, we train and develop and we nurture and raise and do just like every other high school. Um, we take on the same responsibilities. We have the same challenges. Um, they're some of our guys a little bit bigger.
but their brains develop the same as every other kid, whether they're six foot seven or five foot six, meaning they're still teenagers. Yeah. So there's going to be moments for them not to be perfect. But that's what they're in these environments. That's why they're in this type of program, because what happens to them to get to their 25, 26 years old, where they say our front lobe develops. I might question that still until 30 when I was a young man. Mm -hmm. But to make a long story short, that's what football is supposed to be about. It's supposed to be. Trent Dilford, I actually talked to him, I texted him a few times. One of my coaches met him in the Elite 11 or whatever it was. So they might be a, a future game for us with he and I. Mm -hmm. I think Roger will play again. I'm excited about Claude. There's some good men out here that, that don't mind challenging themselves as well as their team. So I'm looking forward to those type of uh challenges in years to come hey uh, all right Larry, um well coach every every year we have a new tournament down uh, an event down in valdosta it's called the uh, uh georgia versus whatever other state challenge so maybe next year we'll do the georgia maryland challenge and have you you and another one of your maryland uh, brothers come down there and play uh, uh colquitt and lounds so we'll be absolutely cool. we'll be i would love it yep um, that'll be great so you mentioned the name a, a couple of uh, about a couple, maybe a few minutes ago. I want to talk more about it. A lot of the haters thought when Biff coach po Poji left, you guys were done and now you're better than ever. Tell us, tell us what he's meant to the program pre and post uh, his tenure there. Absolutely. You know, Biff is extremely successful at a lot of things outside of football, also business, life and he's done a tremendous job of, of creating some of the most uh, 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 respectable but most so powerhouse programs at Gilman with with guys that are you know big fast strong whatever you want to call it so for years 18 out of 21 years I believe in our conference he won the championship they did and of course nobody ridiculed them for that hey nobody said hey get out the league yeah, you know what they did but but they did they, 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 but they did accuse him like they always do when you start winning a lot, recruiting, uh, you know, pink and great shirt and kids, and uh, <laughs> it's it's really he again. Oh. He knew he was at the top then because he was getting the same hate you're getting now. I was about to say, but what I knew about him as a man, and, and you know, they said if you can't beat him, join them. I'm just kidding. They're the only teams I didn't beat. Actually, I beat McDonough the year McDonough beat them. Um, I beat we beat McDonough when I was the head coach. Mm -hmm. They had a powerhouse team, and then. We just came up short with Gilman. But the point I'm making, he came over. He did a tremendous job, brought some of his staff over. And it was an unbelievable uh, process to get us to kind of get the jump started and going really well. But the machine is in place. The brand is in place. And the, the guys that we have in place now, literally, conceivably, this could be the best team that's ever been put together at St. Francis. On paper, it looks like that. Mm -hmm. We're going to find out whether or not what I'm made of as a head coach and right. my other coaches. Both my coordinators are brand new as coordinators. It's going to be exciting. So this is growing pains. Justin Winters is taking over as my defensive coordinator. Ryan Burbank is taking over as the offensive coordinator. So now it's like, okay, this is a true signature for myself on what it is we do as a staff as well as the players. But Biff was great uh, to St. Francis before. He actually was the catalyst to plant the seed money in 2008 to get it started. And then he was at Gilman still. Not just St. Francis, but Biff used to pay for everybody in our conference, at least one or two kids, tuitions. So they complain about him, but they're taking his money yeah. in order for kids yeah. to go to school there. So that's the most hypocritical thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, yep. Very hypocritical. They will take his check to pay for three to five kids or two or one, but they, they, they have a problem when he does it for places that's not theirs. Mm -hmm. So that's huge. I mm -hmm. want to make sure that point is clear. Then he came in and was was a big part of the, the build up to St. Francis. And then since he's been gone, extremely. So we talk. He gives me encouraging words. He's at Michigan. There's still a couple of guys that are three guys actually from St. Francis at Michigan. Now he coaches again. Blake Corm, the Kyle Hill Green and Derek Moore. And he's going to be a, a lifelong friend. Panther for life. But we are who we are. I am who I am as a head coach. I'm not Biff Poggi. I'm a Shai Hallamarium but I can coach as well as anybody else in this country. I'm also humble enough to know that I have great people around me that are doing better than I do because 
They said a smart CEO brings people that are smarter than him, not a, not as smart or below, because then he's not really smart, is he? So for me, these young guys that are in place, the, the, Justin Winters, Ryan Burbrink, um, Cody Acker, uh, just to name a few, uh, uh, Ben Eaton, I mean, I, uh, Cam Wiggins I, and Wayne Dorsey, these guys all played college football. They played yeah. at a high level. Some played in the NFL. And guess what they're capable of doing? Mentoring and coaching and developing guys to be better than they were. Mm -hmm. So when you have men that do it that way, success comes because they want to see them shine better than they did. And so it becomes infectious. And then our kids recruit each other. So I'll be honest, when I say recruit, when a kid feels good and they've seen success, naturally, their friends want to come along, peers, other ones, colleagues, however you want to spin it. So we're going to be great for years to come only because the core of what our beliefs are line up with exactly what people look for for their children day in and day out of their lives. Coach, here's the last question I have for you. Uh, that is, um, you're still a pretty young guy. You've had a lot of success at the high school level, at the at the top tier level there. What's next for you? You see yourself as a college coach going to the NFL or, or are you you happy staying right there in St. Francis? Uh, you know, it's all about what God tells me. My mission currently is really locked in with St. Francis, see this stadium built. Prior to this, I used to train NFL draft prospects. I used to own an organization. I used to own some gyms, but I also owned a pro team for two years and operated it in 2008, 2009. I owned a franchise in the IFL arena football and it was called the Maryland Maniacs when I paused high school football before I transitioned back to St. Francis. Um, so uh, to be honest with you, I've had opportunities to go to college. It, it hasn't resonated, you know, go in one year out the other. It hasn't, you know, migrated up here yet. So my heart is so into this. I, I can't describe it for you. My motivation and my purpose is where I'm at right now. Gotcha. And I'm, I'm extremely, when I tell you to this day, I'm actually in Palm Springs right before camp. I'm hanging out with my 14-year-old angel, my daughter. Um, she, she lives in Colorado now. So he's given me a breath of fresh air to save her life. God has. And she's in remission of cancer. She speaks three languages. Um, so since he's given me the biggest gift any man or woman could have, and that's their child's life, so I don't have to bury her. I could walk her down the aisle and I watch her graduate. I'm going to serve him unconditionally. So he hasn't released me yet. So when, when that day, when if ever you hear Coach Masai is going on, to, because that's the only next place would be college. I wouldn't see myself any other high school, of course. But if, if it was, if I go to college, God has completely released me. And, and I, guess what? I don't see it happening anytime soon. I enjoy gotcha. this too. Yeah. Larry, he said it before, Panther for life. I can tell you when I visited the campus and when you get the tour, you know, it's it, – the, the school is like half school, half museum. You know, if you go up mm -hmm. on the second floor there, they have they have the bed that the the uh, sister that started the school slept in back in um, 1828. They have a, they found a Bible, like a 200 year old Bible that they have preserved. So it's literally a half school, half museum. You go that you you go there, you tour the place. You're going to leave a fan for life. I'm telling you, that's how infectious the school is. Absolutely. That's good stuff, man. Good stuff. Joe, you got anything else? No, I'm good. I'm good. I, uh, I just want to thank the, the coach for, for hanging out with us. You know, this wasn't easy. Like you said, he's in uh, Palm Springs uh, getting ready. Uh, uh, he's getting his mind ready and his body ready uh, for the start of the season on 827 when they're in Canton, Ohio against East St. Louis, Illinois. Um, coach, thanks for all that you do, you know, not only for your program, uh, but you know, for that area, for that city and of Baltimore, you, you got everybody excited and I just can't wait to the season to get started and, and just watch the progression from week one through week 10, 11. I appreciate you guys so much, Larry, Joe. It's been an honor to be on here, um, to be named in the breath of some of those coaches that are at the high school level to say that I got a chance to be in that same, uh, breath and the same conversation. Again, I give it all the credit and glory to God. And it, it, I'm living a, a, a true dream, you know, a true dream, a dream that I have had since I was a young man. And all God has done is allow it to happen. And and, I, and I'm grateful for you guys to have me on. It was a pleasure. It, it's actually fun. 
anytime, any any place, you know, I'll be more than willing to talk. As long as I'm talking about my kids, I'm good. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, God yeah. bless you, Coach. Best of luck on this upcoming season, and thank you for uh, joining us tonight. I appreciate it. You guys have a good night. Thank I'll you, see you in sir. a few weeks. Take night. care.